So you might sometimes hear the term IFN as you progress into this hobby. And if you're a beginner, you might be confused about what that is exactly. Well, perfect, because I am making a video about it. First, a huge thanks to Steve Mendel, the first astrophotographer to discover IFN uh, through photographs. And he's also the first person who came up with the term IFN. Uh, he reviewed my blog post and kind of you know, the script for the video here that I'm using. So this is to ensure that uh, everything is correct. So everything I'm teaching you here is accurate. And um, so thank you so much, Steve, who is an expert at IFN. So in short, IFN stands for Integrated Flux Nebula. And it's mostly made up of space dust illuminated by all the stars in our galaxy. So in this video, I'm going to tell you what IFN is exactly, uh, how to capture it in your images, and give you tips on where and how to photograph IFN. So despite the inclusion of nebula in the name, IFN is not really considered a nebulous object, uh, as there is no star formation activity going on, but rather just interstellar dust. Unlike the emission nebulae and reflection nebulae we all love, uh, IFN is not illuminated by the stars near it, but rather by the integrated flux of every star in our galaxy. This means that IFN clouds are very faint without any brighter regions, uh, making them very difficult to photograph and almost impossible from a light polluted location. When photographed, IFN looks like faint, barely visible grayish clouds in the background, and special processing techniques can be used to enhance the brightness and details of the IFN, which we can talk about later. So in this mouthful name of integrated flux nebula, um, here's a breakdown of each term. So integrated is for all the combined amount of light coming from the stars in our Milky Way that all together illuminate the dust. Now we have flux, uh, this is the total amount of light, so known as the flux, and nebula, uh, which is the nature of the diffuse structure itself. So integrated flux nebula is nebula that is visible because of all the combined light from our galaxy. So IFN can be found in several regions in our night sky, with the majority of it being located at high galactic altitudes, both to the north and south celestial poles. So thanks to astrophotography, IFN has been found near several deep sky objects that are popular uh, for example, M81 and M82, which is probably the most uh, popular region for IFN in the sky. We also have the Iris Nebula, there's so much around there. You also have M15, for example, which we imaged uh, in the past, and more like Polaris and a few others. So sometimes online you see an image with some dust and people call it IFN, when it's in fact ISM. So I want to make sure we all know the difference between ISM and IFN, because yes, it's very really simple to confuse and it's normal, you know, when you're a beginner or when you have not done the research about this that you think is IFN, but let's make sure we know uh, what it is in your image. So ISM is interstellar medium. So it is dust that is located within our Milky Way. And this dust is illuminated by the stars nearby. So the stars that are very close to this dust. So a good example of ISM is the Taurus Molecular Cloud Complex this is very close by dust that is lit up by the stars around it. So it's not IFN even though it looks like it. Now, if you enjoy learning about all this space dust so far, you will also enjoy learning about other things in the world around us. This is where Imprint comes in, which we would like to thank for being a sponsor in this video. Imprint is a brand new way to learn about different topics using an app that is beautifully illustrated and animated. It was designed based on the science of learning, the lessons are taught with both text and visuals, and you can build a habit around learning rather than scrolling forever. I, of course, started with a lesson about learning uh, astronomy, which is uh, very exciting because you can learn about very difficult topics like black holes in this example, but with such easy and fun lessons like these. To try everything Imprint has to offer, seven days for free, you can use our QR code that you see here, as well as the link in the description. And as followers of Galactic Hunter, you will get a 30% off coupon uh, for the Imprint annual subscription.
So how do you capture IFN? So there are three major requirements uh, to be able to capture IFN, ranked in my opinion from most to least important. So number one, we have the integration time. Number two, we have the location. And number three, we have the equipment. So if you want to photograph IFN, good luck because you will need some patience. Um, IFN is extremely faint and you will need to spend many hours capturing data if you hope to reveal any trace of IFN. Uh, the best exposure time to use depends on the camera you own, but most cool cameras uh, for astronomy nowadays have an optimal exposure time between 10 and 30 minutes. And the total integration time you should aim for is simple, as long as you possibly can. Uh, we suggest aiming for at least 20 hours of exposure uh, in total for most cases, and this number can vary depending on the quality of your sky and how fast your telescope is, which we'll cover next. So the location is number two, and because of how faint IFN is, you will need to get away from the city and image far from light pollution. Uh, bottle one or bottle two skies are the best for this. With bottle three and four, uh, you should be okay, but getting great IFN in your shot will be very, very difficult if you image from bottle five or worse. And you will require much more integration time than if you were to travel a bit farther to darker skies. So when I imaged the Iris Nebula, I made a video uh, where I was driving an hour and a half away from Vegas. And in that image, uh, there was a lot of IFN around it. So I purposefully drove north of Las Vegas because I knew the Iris Nebula was north. And so the north sky would be very, very clean. And the light pollution dome from Vegas would be behind me in the south. So if you are planning to image IFN, make sure you know which part of the sky it is on and escape the city light driving towards your object, just so your target is in the uh, cleanest part of the, of the sky and not drowning in any light pollution dome. And number three is the equipment. So you can photograph IFN using almost any equipment, even with a stock DSLR camera and no telescope. Yes, it's possible. Uh, the most important piece will be your lens slash telescope as it requires to be fast. So if you're using a telescope, we suggest a reflector telescope, like for example, f3.9, f4, or a RASA, which is f2, or a fast refractor telescope, which is f5 or faster. For most of our uh, IFN shots, we used our RASA 8 or our uh, f5 refractor. So a fast telescope is crucial if you want to be able to see the IFN without spending weeks and weeks on the same target. If you don't own a telescope, you can use a DSLR lens instead. So we recommend a high quality lens that is also fast. The very best lens, in my opinion, for this task is gonna be the Rockinon uh, 135mm f2. It's super fast and it's uh, the perfect focal length for most objects with IFN around it. So it's perfect. So IFN is the faintest matter out there, and it's often believed that there is no way to see it visually. But yes, it is. So Mel Bartels built several small and fast telescopes in order to look for IFN from his dark sky location. He started a journey to find as many IFN regions as possible uh, visually using his own telescope in 2006. So we have a section about Mel Bartels' uh, you know, challenges on our website, but he explains that at first he thought it was impossible to find you know, several regions of IFN with his telescope and just eyes, but he ended up finding many of them and started to sketch them on uh, maps. So this is very interesting. He started with M1 and M2, which is of course one of the best places to look at for IFN. And he explains that he almost never uses filters. Since he started, he has sketched more than 140 um, IFN regions from his observations, including this incredible all sky map of IFN clouds for the spring. Now, how to process IFN? <sighs> Processing IFN is very hard. The key is to reveal as much IFN as possible without completely ruining the target you were shooting originally. This can happen because of the difference in brightness between deep sky objects and the IFN. Uh, so bringing up the details 
and brightness in the IFN without protecting the galaxy or cluster or nebula will result in a completely overblown result. So the key to processing IFN in a clean manner would be to, for example, use masks uh, to protect your main objects if you have to, work on the IFN details and brightness on the uh, starless version only uh, of your data. Also, you should use the detail enhancement and noise reduction tools very conservatively, uh, or else you'll have a, a very big mess at the end. And also, always check how your main object looks like whenever applying a process to the IFN. So what coloration should IFN be? So this is a tough question because you might not know how much to push the red or the green or the blue colors uh, for the IFN clouds during processing, and you might end up with a very unrealistic result. So IFN is believed to be either gray slash blue if it is mostly illuminated by hot young stars, or gray slash red if the integrated flux light coming from the Milky Way originates from cooler older stars. So to be sure to stay accurate, first raise the overall saturation slider and see if your IFN dust becomes more red or more blue, then work from there. So to conclude, uh, IFN, or Integrated Flux Nebula, is pretty much interstellar space dust that's illuminated by all the stars from our Milky Way. Uh, it sits very high or very low from the galactic plane, so it, that's why it's so faint, because it's so far. And all the light coming from the galaxy are um, slowly hitting those uh, IFN clouds. But capturing IFN is very, very difficult. You'll need long exposure times, uh, a dark sky, and a fast uh, lens or telescope. It's also very, very difficult to process, so if you're a beginner, maybe try your hand at different targets first. After many years of doing this hobby, I now love the challenge of uh, capturing IFN and especially processing it. It's always rewarding at the end to have a nice, clean result without too much noise. So yeah, it's fun. So we'll see you guys next time and uh, hopefully you learned from this video and we hope that you can capture some great IFN picks. Thanks guys.